Okay, everyone, this is Greg Seagrove, and I'm host of Reflections of Uncommon Common Man. We have here our guest who's named Jeremy Myers. Uh, he's a pastor of Transformation Life Church. Is that the name of it? Okay. Yes. Okay. And, of course, I've got Jimmy Catrone, my co-host here, and my grandson, Connor. And uh, I want to go ahead and get right into it. You know, uh, we were talking before the program that uh, I've known, I guess, uh, how long How long ago was it when you worked over there at Santa Fe uh, Restaurant? <laughs> Probably about 20 years ago, man. 20 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't, I can't remember. I know it was probably in early 2000s. Yeah, and, uh, it was actually year 2000. Oh, okay. Precisely. I didn't yeah. realize it was that long ago. Yeah. Um, and I met Jeremy. Uh, he's, I've always thought Jeremy was one of the greatest guys I've ever met. Um, he uh, he had a great voice. Uh, very, I guess you'd call yourself a tenor, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I used to remember him singing uh, uh, when we did karaoke over there. Uh, he would always sing uh, Doc of the Bay, I believe, wasn't it? Yeah. So oh, not the Doc of the Bay. It was um, Under the Boardwalk. Under the Boardwalk. Yeah. yeah. You did uh, karaoke. <laughs> huh? Uh, you did karaoke at Santa Fe, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, But anyway, I uh, also met a great friend at that time, uh, and uh, Gary Scott, who ran the karaoke. We've been friends ever since. Um, and he and his wife, uh, him and his wife, Jeanette. Um, okay, you know, uh, Jeremy's got a, a great story of redemption. I, I love stories of redemption. Uh, we were talking earlier about, uh, that fact. Uh, one of, you know, I've seen people in my own life who, um, I, I knew the kind of life they were living for a while. And, and, uh, then all of a sudden they came you know, one day I discovered that they were changed. You know, I mean, I saw it before my very eyes. Um, and, uh, you know, I, from a, as a student of history, I like stories of redemption. You know, mm. a couple of my favorite stories are uh, Louis Zamperini, who wrote, who uh, was a subject of a, a movie and the book Unbroken. Uh, World War II, uh, fought in World War II. He was a long distance runner. Um, and, uh, also a guy named, uh, Jake DeShazer, I have a little hard time mentioning his name. He was one of the Doolittle Raiders that, uh, was shot down, um, during the Doolittle Raid, was captured by the Japanese, spent three years in a Japanese prisoner of war camp, as did Louis Zamperini, and both of them became embittered toward the Japanese and toward, uh, uh, their captors, and uh, matter of fact, in uh, uh, in uh, Jake DeShazer's situation, uh, he became a Christian, I think, while he was in the uh, camps, and he came back at the you know at the end of the war. Here, you know, there was no brutal, more brutal of an enemy than the Japanese, and you know they put. ISIS to shame the things they did to American prisoners of war and uh, and allied prisoners of war. And Jake DeShazer came back to Japan after the war and uh, witnessed and uh, testified to the Japanese people. And he ran across the guy one day by the name of uh, Commander Fushida, who had been the man who led the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, he commanded the Air Force, Naval Air Forces that attacked Pearl Harbor. And Commander mm -hmm. Fushida was just, um, you know, uh, kind of, he was touched by this, uh, but he, he was hostile to it at first. And because he thought that when, you know, that the Japanese, that the Americans, once the Japanese prisoner of war came back to Japan, that they would tell stories of horror and, all that, how they were treated, and um, when he came, when uh, they came to Japan, and Fushida talked to them, they said, "Well, the Americans treated us fine. They treated us very well." And this blew Fushida away because he knew how the Japanese treated American prisoners of war, and he was convicted. And eventually, Fushida became 
a Baptist minister. Mm. And for the rest of his life, he, you know, test, he witnessed and went around the world preaching the gospel. Um, and so when you see that, you know, when people say uh, they doubt the existence of God, they, these these kinds of testimonies um, refute that, you know. And uh, so getting into your story, I, wa I, wanna, I didn't mean to take up that much time, but, um, um, you know, uh, tell us a little bit. Uh, first of all, uh, where uh, are you from, Murfreesboro, or? Uh, from well, this area? Yeah, I'm not raised and born in Murfreesboro per se, but um, I claim Murfreesboro is my home. Uh, okay. um, I was actually a Navy brat uh, for a very short period of time. Both my parents uh, were in the Navy um, straight out of high school. That's where they met and got married. Uh -huh. um, and then uh, my my mom uh, got an honorable discharge when I was born, and my dad was discharged shortly after that. Um, but I was actually born in Maryland. Oh, okay. um, and I uh, lived in several different places um, early on, and then we uh, settled here in Murfreesboro when I was about five or six years old. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, um, now, where did you, you go to, to high school at? Um, went to uh, Mitchell Nielsen Elementary School, okay. went to Central Middle School before it became uh, Central Magnet School yeah. now, um, and then I'm a graduate of Oakland High School back oh, when okay. Murfreesboro only had two high schools. Now there's like <laughs> 13 or 14 different high schools, I think, um, in Rutherford County or yeah. greater Rutherford County area. Right. Yeah, we've grown a lot. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I, anybody got any other questions along that line uh, they would like to ask him or about his upbringing? Uh, Not yet. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm listening. Um, He's preparing the big ones for down the road. <laughs> I, I, I see the wheels turning over there. <laughs> got to okay. watch out for this guy. <laughs> okay. Um, now, did your uh, – did your uh, – is your father still alive or my dad is still living um he lives actually um about two hours uh northeast of knoxville in a small okay. town called harrogate tennessee um and he is remarried for the fourth or fifth time maybe oh okay um, and my parents were uh, separated when I was two and divorced when I was four. Oh, okay. Um, and my dad was in show business, believe it or not. My dad is actually an Elvis impersonator. Wow. Um, and, ha <laughs> and has been for um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the majority of his life. He right. That's what he has done um, as his sole source of income at some point or another. And um, so in the 80s when I was growing up, when I really could have used the influence of my father, my father was on the road. Right. Um, so he was hitting... Um, uh, casinos and uh, nightclubs in Louisiana and, right. and Las Vegas and out on the West Coast in California. Um, and at one point was um, dubbed Little Elvis um, by the Presley Foundation, allowed to use the El and allowed to use uh, Elvis's name in his show. Um, and was wow. um, authorized by the Presley Foundation as as the um, I, I, not the best, but the the highest regarded. Um, impersonator, uh, 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 you know, in the mar in the market. Of course, you know you you have a lot you have a lot of respect for Elvis Presley and his music. And yeah, I love uh, Elvis, Elvis did say Elvis. one time that the um, uh, highest level of compliment was to was impersonation. To be impersonated. Uh -huh, yeah. yeah, to yeah, be impersonated. There's a bit of a hierarchy because some of them just kind of make a joke out of the whole deal, don't they? Uh, they do. I mean, but uh, um, uh, my dad's kind of the real caveat. I mean, yeah. he he goes the extra mile. He looks like Elvis twenty four seven. So. Oh, did you? Um, after your parents divorced, did your mom remarry or? My mom has never remarried. Oh, okay. um, she's been single her entire life. I think a couple of times after um, uh, my parents got divorced, um, she attempted relationships with other men and uh, they just never seemed to work out. Right, and so, right. You have siblings? Um, I don't. I'm an only child. Yeah. <laughs> And unfortunately, every once in a while, it um, it shows that I'm an only child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as as my as my um, wife would say, yeah, yeah, she goes, your your only childism is a uh, is uh, shining through today. So now, was your mom in military as well? Or my not? mom was in the military. Yeah, so she you, you she, continued to move. Well, we didn't move around a lot because uh, when when I was born, she was discharged. She had signed okay. up for honorable discharge immediately um, upon uh, b going going into birth, and um, so um, after that, we moved to California to live with my grandmother, mm -hmm. which is my dad's my dad's mom. Okay, um, 
Now, you said your mom was in uh, in the military. Were both your mother and daddy in the Navy? Uh, both my mother and my father were in the Navy. They both graduated high school um, about the same time, same year, I believe, and went to uh, Pensacola, Florida. Were they uh, from, Florida. from here? They were not from here. My mom was from Illinois, and my dad was from Michigan, oh, actually, okay. and they met in the Navy. And, and then they were uh, stationed in Bethesda, Maryland, and my dad was a machinist mate, and my mom actually worked for Navy Communications, which if you know anything, any history um, about uh, government agencies, um, the Navy uh, Communication Division is what ne- became our now NSA. Yeah. Um, so yeah. she worked for the NSA before it actually became, but before it actually became the NSA. What yeah. What year would that be? You know that that time um, frame. That would well, I was born in '77, so um, and I believe the actual NSA was uh, formulated in like '81 or '82. Mm-hmm. So she served for Navy Communications probably. Um, Let's see, that would be 74 to 70, late 77. Mm. Yeah. She worked oh. all the way up until she went into labor. <clears throat> wow. Um, now, you were born what year? 1977, December. Yeah, years old, as, uh, same age as my youngest daughter. So yeah. She was born in 77. Yeah, I'll be 43 in uh, December. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. she was born in March, so. Um, now, uh, you you know I, well well, well I, I'm gonna ask one more question. We'll get on to a different subject. But your mom, um, how did she, how did they end up here? I mean, uh, well, we were living actually uh, when I was around four or five years old. We were living in Illinois with my grandmother oh, okay. and uh, my uncle, who was kind of like the patriarch of our family on my mom's side, had landed a job in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Uh, with the Daily News Journal paper that, if y'all remember, it used to be printed here in town. Now they don't print anything in Murfreesboro. It's all printed in Nashville at the Tennessean. But, um, and so he got a job as a uh, press room uh, operator. And so he moved down here. And lo and behold, like three months later, the whole family moved down. Oh, okay. <laughs> or a good portion of us anyway. Yeah. And we've been here ever since. Yeah. So. Um, okay. Well, let's um, let's talk about the uh former jeremy and then we'll get to the well the present jeremy yeah. <laughs> okay yeah um, the then and now uh, the then and now yeah. okay um <clears throat> now like i like i told you earlier i didn't really formulate any questions because i i really other than what my wife's told me she listened to your testimony and uh she told me that you had uh had an addiction problem with I think you had alcohol and drugs, maybe? Uh, alcohol and drugs, yeah, and actually was a daily user of crystal meth for about six years. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that you uh, while also uh, was involved in a homosexual lifestyle. That's correct, yeah. Okay. I, li- I lived as a gay man uh, in Nashville, uh, Tennessee, um, from like age... 18 to about 31. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, and also you actually spent some time in jail. I did. A little yeah. bit. Yeah. yeah. Probably not as much as I should have, but I did. <laughs> I spent a little bit of time. Yeah. <laughs> if any of my old arresting officers are out there listening, please do not come arrest me. I'm a good guy now. <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk about the um, uh, the addiction problem first. Um, when Did you realize when you were... Uh, involved in that well first of all did you ever become what you would call a an addict in terms of uh you couldn't you couldn't i mean it controlled your daily life uh most definitely um uh as time progressed i definitely uh became what you would call cliche alcoholic and addict uh came to the point where i could not survive without drinking could not survive without using my drugs of choice um but my story is a little interesting because um i actually started using drugs and alcohol to offset the choices that i was already making right, in my life right right um, 
because uh, living as a homosexual man in the Nashville area, um, I grew up in a Christian family. Um, I grew up with a mother who was very adamant about taking me to church, about putting me in uh, f- in uh, faith communities, and uh, uh, kind of worked overtime to put me in touch with uh, men that would be kind of role models in my life since my father wasn't present. I can a- actually have to, you know, hats off to my mom for right. actually putting forth all that effort to put me, you know, in Boy Scouts right. and um, find environments where they there were men that actually wanted to be involved in my life that wanted to um, pour some time into me. So uh, my addiction actually spawned out of my out uh, of home. my immorality choices right. that I was making. Yeah. Oh, well, let me say I, um, I I try to train myself. You know, you may agree or disagree with this. Uh, I I don't like the word gay uh-huh. uh, because I'm old enough. That I remember when gay was a right. word that I could use. A straight man could use. You know? Well, if you look it up in the Webster Dictionary, it still s- means to be elated or happy. Right, yeah. right. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, at one time I could I could say I was a young and gay and get away with it, you know? Exactly, right. <laughs> Yeah, not then, anymore. Yeah, today you can't get away with the yeah. young or the gay. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> he's got a sense of humor here. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty dry, uh, but yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, but um, but now really, um, I, I I'm. Do you do you want to say you're gay? <laughs> <laughs> no, but <laughs> Greg is very Greg is very elated and happy today. Yeah. He is. Um, he is. Listen, he's laughing. He made me forget he's what laughing, the heck I was getting ready to say. Um, oh, I know what I was going to say. Um, I hate politically correct terms. Mm. I, I try to avoid them. Like yeah. you know, um, you know, I, I don't mean to get off track here, but um, but like I, I don't like using the word gay. I don't like using African American. Um, you know, because first of all, if you're, if you're, um, uh, a person that came to this country from Africa and you became a naturalized citizen, then you're African American. But uh, actually the, 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 the term to use would be if you were born in this country and, and raised a black person, uh, a person of Af- African descent, but that's too many words to say in one sentence, you yeah. know? So I, I look at it from the standpoint of, uh. You know, when I was a kid, the the politically correct term to say was colored, you know, or Negro, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, as and, and when they got into the 60s, uh, they started, they wanted, you know, re, uh, black people wanted to refer to them as black people. Uh, and I always thought, well, that's fair because I'm white and they're black, you know. Uh, so I kind of leave it at that. But sure. I didn't mean to get off into that. But I'm just saying um, is... Uh, I, I hate political correctness, so I try to avoid it every every mm-hmm. opportunity I get. So that whatever that means, you know. Um, okay, now you you say, you know, your problems were um, associated primarily with your choices you were making uh, in the homosexual uh, lifestyle. Um, you know, you mentioned something. Uh, and this may a good, be a good point to bring this up. And it's something I've always wanted to ask somebody who has experienced that lifestyle. Um, <laughs> is that uh, I, I have a theory, and I think this relates to not only lesbianism, but male homosexuality, that the father is key, uh, the role of the father in the family is key to uh, how children turn out now personally i think um well well before we get into that let me ask you a question uh do you think um that homosexuality are you born a homosexuality or is it a choice that's a really hard question um or born a homosexual, I think is what I meant to say. I usually don't respond with the with the uh, response that I'm going to give, but I told you I would be 100% transparent right, right. in this interview. Um, and so I have a very interesting uh, take on, on that question, and, and it is this, is if you roll it back to, um, you know, the Scripture says that we're created in His image. Right. Okay? Well, per, uh, for a person to actually be created by God in His image, 
is actually a different point in the space-time continuum than their actual birth date. So if you believe that a person is a person from the first sperm and, and egg coming in contact right. and that first cell dividing, and that's the creative point. So um, the birth point is separate from that. OK, the birth point is 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 after they have uh, their their flesh has been merged with their spirit and their soul and knitted in their mother's womb and they are born into a sinful world. So if you look at it from that point, can you be born gay? I do believe that Satan um, weaves a certain web of deception and attack towards each person. I believe that it is very targeted. I think that it is very strategic. Um, if we choose to believe that it's not, we are just living in ignorance, honestly. Uh, because I've experienced in my own life um, that Satan is very strategic. Um, and, and when I say that, it, it, I say it because it, 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 my tendency to uh, lean towards um, attraction to the same sex was just so tightly woven into the fabric of my life um, that it was hard to get away from. I mean, it was everywhere I turned. I ran into it in Boy Scouts. I ran into it in the um, church that I attended. Actually, one of my partners when I was in high school uh, was someone that attended my church. Um, I, I ran into it in the neighborhood that I was in. It was like everywhere I turned, uh, my best friend in high school was gay um, or was dealing with homosexual uh, with homosexuality, same same uh, gender uh, attraction. Um, and so uh, and I firmly believe that um, it, it, it's an even mix of. Um, the attack of the enemy and the choices that I made based on the attacks that he put put uh, put towards me or put uh, put in my path. Now I've I've not been in 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 any of my recovery and uh, any of my redemption or any of my transformation. I have never said, well, the reason I made the choices I did is because of X, Y, Z. Uh, because anybody can look at my past and my story and say, well, um, he uh, had same-sex tendency because his father was absent. Well, I could blame it on that. Um, I could blame it on the fact that I was raised by two women, my mom and my grandmother. Um, I could blame it on the fact that I had um, uh, m probably more uh, same-sex experiences as a young um, uh uh, adolescent and uh, teen than the average person may may have. Um, I could blame it on um, I could blame it on all these different things. But what I choose to do is I choose to look back through the history of my journey and look for opportunities that I can um, take ownership of my own choice. Um, and what that does is that provides me greater victory as I move forward because it, it provides me a springing uh, a forward point where I can um, guard myself against future temptation if I know the reasons that were surrounding why I made that choice in the first place, if that makes sense. Um, so in a lot of people, a lot of people who are redeemed from a homosexual lifestyle will say, um, uh, the Lord set me free, and I, I never dealt with anything ever again. I have a really hard time believing that because my redemption story is so uh, intense and is so um, uh, real, uh, but the enemy uh, is not changing his plan for nobody. He doesn't have any new tricks up his sleeve. Um, I, I firmly believe that his plan of attack uh, uh, against you is... Uh, lasts a lifetime. Um, and the reason I say that is, is because if he continues to hit you with the same temptation over and over and over again, um, then he can try to um, pervert your mind to thinking that you're not really saved and in God's hand and under God's control or within God's favor and blessing the way that you think that you are. And that's actually one of his biggest attacks against us. I mean, for you guys, how many times have you had moments in your life where that thought comes into your mind and you say, well, maybe I'm not really saved or maybe I'm not the Christian or Christ follower that I thought I was. 
Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, th- I think I took a little rabbit trail. I, I, I almost forgot what, what question I was supposed to be answering. Did well, I answer your question? Uh, I'm actually glad you went off in that direction because I think I was getting a cart before the horse. But uh, um, but I, here's the way I've, I've kind of looked at it. And, 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 you know, I look at it this way. I've, I've studied the Bible pretty intently uh, over the years, you know. And I know that the Bible is pretty clear, I think. You, I don't know if you agree with this, on uh, homosexuality is a sin. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, cheating on your wife's a sin. Right. Uh, everything you you can get involved in, whether it be gambling or whatever, you know, being an alcoholic, a drug addict, whatever, uh, that's unbiblical, Okay. Uh, and even even uh, narrow it down to things that are smaller that people try to justify, right? Um, such as gossip, right, or being quick to anger, absolutely, um, or yeah. or disrespecting another person's right. uh, point of view or something like that. Right. Though, and anything that happens outside the righteousness that right. is God right. is sin. Uh, well, but that's, uh, that's okay. So we can actually even compare it to just normal. Or, you know, male and female fornication, can't we? Absolutely. Because if I went out and found a woman, is it is it any less, you know, a form of fornication if I went and found a man to hook up with? The well, same, same thing in yeah. the eyes of God. It's the same thing. Unfortunately, in the culture of our church, it may be viewed as a little bit different. But that's well, but see, uh, a whole bib- different biblically story. Biblically speaking, getting, <laughs> getting back to my main point, biblically yeah. speaking, we can say that homosexuality is a sin. Yes. You know, okay. Now, um, getting back to the where you said God created us in his image, which I believe, mm-hmm. okay, um, I, I have a problem with this idea that someone is born homosexual because... Um, you know, why would God put us in a position that if he already set you on that course, why would he, I believe in free will. I believe that, that God would not put you on a course that he would have to condemn you for, mm-hmm. you know? Well, he didn't. Well, that's, I kind of disagree with that because we're born into Adam, aren't we? Well, absolutely. Now, I'm not, no, he no, no. Ma- like he's talking about like he's having these, t- if he had these temptations today and he chose to act on them, God didn't force Yeah, but I'll, I, the only point I'm coming from is, is we can, you know, uh, it, because I think what the LBG, I get, I can I yeah. lose track of how many letters, yeah. uh, all of <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, they try to, you know, say that there's no way you can be re- redeemed from that. I heard a, of a person who um, has a ministry that deals with sexual addiction and homosexuality. Um, and it's a Christian ministry. And uh, he's been put on the uh, target list for Southern Poverty Law Center in in Montgomery, Alabama, as a as a spreading hate a hate message, because he's trying to minister to uh, former home or, or homosexuals and trying to get them onto the path of redemption. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this is a, a horrible message. It's kind of like saying, uh, I, "This is where I kind of would disagree with uh, someone who's an alcoholic or something." Uh, you, you know. Uh, you know, you you can be redeemed from all the all these things, okay? And uh, and to say that's kind of like you know whether it be climate change or whether it be um, you know uh, anything that a particular group of people say they'll they'll say well the debate's over there, there's no debate on this you know that's yeah. what I'm addressing you mm-hmm. know is that. Is yeah, that, you're not even allowed to discuss it anymore. Right. Like, I, we I, all must think the same. You can't have this discussion we're having today is what and I'm saying by a lot of people would say. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, the the LGBTQ um, agenda is, you know, you have to respect our opinion. But um, in the in, on the other side of the street, as it comes back over to us, uh-huh. for those of us who uh, claim Christian, Christianity and the things of God as our primary purpose in life, um, they don't. A lot of them don't respect that. Right um, now, there is a small sect of of um, people who live a homosexual lifestyle who believe that the two can co 
can coincide. And right. those are those are the the individuals that are even harder to reach. And there are even some faith communities that are stepping out and saying, "Okay, well, um, we're no longer going to preach against homosexuality See, as that's a sin. What we're going me. to include, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, for, for our own church. Being a pastor myself here uh, here in town, uh, we'll never turn. I would never turn a uh, same sex couple away from the church." They want to come attend our church. Oh, absolutely. That's fine. Yeah. But when the Holy Spirit lays on my heart yeah. to um, preach, preach on sin and to absolutely. address that sin specifically, I will preach it, whether they're sitting in this, in, whether absolutely. they're sitting in the room or not. Um, but um, I think that we are called to love. We're cl- we're called to include in community. Um, but we're not called to condone the sin, nor are right. we called to adjust the righteousness of God to meet the agenda of other people. Well, you know, um, but, I, but I have a friend who was about to be put on the street, okay? Um, I have to talk to him, you know. But, um, but anyway, um, you know, he had nowhere to go. He's homosexual, okay? Um, you know, I I wasn't going to let him live on the street, so I invited him in my home for about six months, mm-hmm. you know. I'm not trying to virtue signal here or, or toot my own horn. I'm just saying that uh, I felt like that was the Christian thing to do. And, and of course, in his case, uh, he's not the kind of person that he respects me and I respect him, and he would never uh, try to... Uh, Take you advantage know, of your uh, kindness. Uh, yeah, throw it in my face or anything like that. Um, and uh, everything worked out fine. And, you know, when he found he was able to get a home again, he got a home and went out. But I've I've had I, I've had Christians tell me, Greg, how could you do that? You know, uh, because uh, he was a homosexual, you know. And I, I think personally that, what Christ wants us to do is exactly that, you know, is that to help people, you know. Well, I take it. I take it to um, the woman who was caught uh, in the act of adultery. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, Jesus got down on the ground on her level. Right. Um, and helped her up off the floor. And I just think about all these stories from the New Testament of, of, um, and if you think about all the people that Jesus ministered to the most and used as the, um, the the biggest tools of explanation about about the kingdom and about um, uh, following God and, and these sort of things. He used the most shunned um, individuals in the Jewish community, people who committed adultery, uh, people who, 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 um, who stole things. Um, he used Matthew, a tax collector, as one of his as one of his disciples and, you know, and called him to come follow him. And uh, there were people in the crowd who, who disagreed. There were people uh, in the surrounding area that disagreed, you know, why would you want this tax collector, this, this person that rips everybody off, who keeps a piece of everything for himself, who takes more than he's supposed to take to give to Caesar so he can have some for his pocket. Why, why are you going to, uh, you know, uh, glo- almost like glorify and lift this person up? Um, and I, I just, I just have to think that, it, it, you know, if we had the opportunity to, um, just sit down face to face with him, it, you know, it would be like, you know, he would be like, you know, I want you to watch and see what I'm going to do in this person's life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like to think, uh, a lot of times about, uh, what if Jesus came, um, at, during the 21st century and, and, he, and as the Messiah, he wasn't set to come. 2000 years ago, he came in current modern society. Um, Once he started his ministry of three years, when he hit the age of 30 to the age of 33, um, where do you think he would be? Yeah. Yeah. Is he going to be at, uh, you know, Six Flags Over Jesus, Joe Osteen as a guest speaker? <laughs> Is he going to be? Um, and I don't have anything against Joe Osteen. I mean, yeah. I, he, you know, a lot of people have stories of redemption and stories of salvation that come from, from his ministry and reading his books and uh, attending his church and that sort of thing. Uh, so I don't want to ever, ever knock another ministry. But uh, do you think that, that, uh, that Jesus is going to be at uh, all of these big, you know, uh, uh, the Mormon Tabernacle uh, Church in uh, Brooklyn. I mean, all mm. these big places. 
Or is he going to be down the road underneath the bridge where everybody lives in right. tents that are made out of uh, tarps? Right. Uh, is he going to be um, uh, down on the square ministering to the people that are right. sleeping on benches? Right. Is he going to be um, in the uh, projects with single mothers who can't feed their children? Is he going to be walking in the front door of a gay bar? And sitting Mm -hmm. down at the bar so he can minister to somebody whose life is at rock bottom. Where's he going to be? Where would he be? And so if you, if, and those are the things that we view as, you know, scum of the earth in current, in in current, um, uh, in current society, we think that, I mean, it's okay to go out and sleep, sleep around on your wife or, or go have sex with whoever you want to go have sex with. But, um, uh, you know, but, uh, a, a Christian, a churchgoer is not going to find themselves walking, darkening the doorway of a gay bar and going in and sitting and minister to somebody yeah. uh, in a bar. And a lot of them don't want to go down to the bridge where people live or right. go to the park where, where people sleep at night and um, that sort of thing. And, um, uh, you know, and so I, I, I like to, th- and, and so if you take, you take the things that we're afraid to do today and the groups of people that we're afraid to be around and take that and compare it to the people that Jesus minister to right. um in the bible like the woman at the well for for instance i mean she was a samaritan and if you go do any kind of historical research mm-hmm. i mean even if you just leave the bible out of it mm-hmm. go do a historical research on the the uh conflict between samaria and uh, and and judea I mean, mm. it, they were not supposed to have any contact at all. It was socially forbidden for them to even drink the same water. But Jesus showed up at a well, a Samaritan well, and not only drank the water, but gave a Samaritan a drink from the same spoon that he was using. Yeah. And what happened? Uh, the scripture says that there not only was she saved, she went back to her her town and her land and said, come see about a man that told me everything that I ever did. And the scripture goes on to say that their land was healed. Not only were the people, not only were the people transformed and saved and became followers of Christ, but the actual dirt that they walked on was healed. Right. Their <laughs> land was healed. Their yeah. land was healed. Yeah. They're, they're rolling acres, whatever the case may be. Right. And, and so, I mean, like, what would that look like in, in you know, in, in common day if we could say, you know, if someone had a, a, uh, a, a story of redemption or transformation that was so huge that it actually healed the land that they, the, the land that they lived on. Right. Because that's, right. that's, that, those right. were the sort of things that were happening. Right. And also, too, though, you know, he was the type of guy that he could go in and sit down with the, uh, the uh, Sa- Sadducees and the Pharisees and commune with them, you know. I mean, he affected their lives, you know. We know at least a couple of them that, uh, you know, their lives were changed, you know. But I love how the scripture uh, flows in, 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 in those, uh, and, and there's no change in character right. for Jesus. Right. From whatever group he's ministering to, whether it's the feeding of the five thousand or it's out on the sea with the with he's the, the disciples, he is the same yeah. person. Right. You know, a, a double-minded man is evil in all his right, ways. You right. know, the scripture says that. Right. Um, he's the same person in front of every opportunity. Right. Uh, versus, like today, I mean, how many people do we know, even in our own lives, that they have one face? at church right and then they have another face at work and then they have another face at home this is Um, this is one of the things and you know that i see happening a lot is happening my own family and all that is i'll hear people say um i don't want to go to church with all them hypocrites and i'm and my response to them is oh you're better than jesus you know jesus went to church with hypocrites you know every day or every time you know he was supposed to be there um you know uh at, you know one of my favorite scenes in uh the passion of the christ is when uh jesus everywhere jesus went you see satan lurking in the crowd he's always nearby you know and uh i think this is something that we i think some of the most evil people in the world sit in the church you know um, I mean, that's not a condemnation of churches, you know, but it's a warning. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm reminded of the uh, parable where you have the, the Pharisee and he go, or you have the, 
the poor man, the humble man, he comes in, he and he's uh, praying, saying, God, yeah. forgive me, I'm a sinner, right. I have no right to be in your presence. Right. And then you have the Pharisee who comes in and says, thank you, Lord, that I'm not this guy. Right, right. right. And obviously I didn't tell this right, but, uh, yeah, you know, well, we says, know who's, like, who's going to be exalted, right? Right, mm. right. The ironic part of reading that parable is often you'll read it and say, well, thank goodness I'm not like the Pharisee. Right. Right. It's ironic because you're being the Pharisee in right, that case, right. right? And I think that's what you see a lot. Like, take, for example, the story about, you know, your friend who moves in with you. And people say, oh, Greg, you're going to do that? Yeah. It's like, and you have the story you just told where people say, I don't want to go to church with all these hypocrites. And, you know, it makes me wonder, well, who are the modern day Pharisees? Right. Mm. Is it not us? Right. We're I'm being the modern, like, we're the Pharisees now. We're the yeah. religious people now, you know? Well, and we like to, and we have to be very careful not to look down on each other for yeah. the decisions they're I making. Get, I guess, too, what I'm saying is, uh, kind of going back to what we started this, is that, you know, if I'm the worst alcoholic in the world, or if I'm the worst sex addict, or if I'm the worst homosexual, or whatever it is, okay? I hold the award for all of those, Greg. Uh, Huh? I hold the I hold the award for all of those. <laughs> <He's the chiefest. laughs> well, well, what, but the point I guess what I'm saying is like uh, I don't want to see us get to a point, and like you said earlier, there there's some churches that are trying to fall in line behind the politically correct thing here. Mm. Is that if I'm if I'm a, a the worst alcoholic in the world, um, what I, I just want honesty. I want you to say especially if you know better, okay, to say uh, I'm the worst alcoholic in the world, but I do this because I choose to uh, and not try to legitimize it through the Scripture. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's where I'm coming from. Well, that's the whole idea, ain't it? Like repent, confess your sins, say I ain't worthy for heaven. Right. And a lot of the times we want to justify our sins, act like we are worthy. Right. And I think that's that we've popularized it in the media and everywhere else is that, um, you know, uh, you know, you take gay, gay marriage, for example. One of my biggest objections to gay marriage was um, not so much uh, people having the right to get married if they want to. Or have a union or whatever. I mean, from a spiritual standpoint, I don't think that's a marriage. But, but you know, if you look at it, when I went to get my, um, I went to get my marriage license. I didn't go to a federal courthouse. I went to the state court, uh, a county courthouse, to get my wedding, uh, my marriage license. Okay. So the way they legitimize gay marriage, or you know, here I go with the word gay again. Yeah. Who's the <laughs> uh, now? Is that, uh, or same sex marriage, is that um, they've, they've let it fall under the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment. Mm. And so what that, apply, what that implies to me is, and, and the only way, like, for example, if I'm born white or if I'm born black, I had no. I had no choice in the matter. I, I just came out that way, okay? So the, the 14th Amendment would apply to me because, or whether you're Asian, black, whatever, because you had no choice in that matter, okay? If you start calling behavior uh, to be, you know, if you start saying behavior is protected under the, the 14th Amendment, mm-hmm. you're opening up a can of worms. That's you true. You know, because... Because now, what is going to stop some guy who wants to marry his dog, or uh, you know, a man wanting to marry his daughter, or a brother wanting to marry his sister, or or polygamy, or or whatever? That you've opened up a big can of worms. You, you see what I'm saying? Though so that was my objection, you mm-hmm. know, to that. You mm-hmm. know, hey, not to get off the rails, but do you really think the state needs to be involved in marriage? I'm not saying they do, but it, but, 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 but that's exactly what I'm saying is that, uh, well, marriage, like if marriage is a spiritual thing, it, it is a, uh, you don't need the state to get married. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but 
when I, you know, from a civil standpoint, the reason marriage was made a civil right was because I think more to protect children and property rights and things like that, okay, which I can understand that. But let's say me and my wife got a, uh, stranded on a deserted island out in the Pacific, and we were the only two there. We can be married before God, you know, uh, sure. it, you know, but, but and that's what I think marriage is, you know, and God created marriage, you know, um, you know, in the Garden of Eden, you know, uh, for example, I, I, I'm getting a little off subject here, but you take um, the argument against polygamy. Uh, you know, I, I had a Mormon friend one time tell me that. Uh, because the patriarchs were polygamists that it's okay for you know us today to to be polygamists but that's not what god created in the in the garden he didn't created monogamy okay and if you look at it the patriarchs were coming out of uh of paganism which that was the practice but by the time jesus came jews were back to monogamy again now you don't yeah. You don't read anything in the Bible about how that happened, you know. But it's, I, I kind of look at it the same way what Jesus said when he was talking to, to I think, the lawyers and they were talking about divorce. He said, I, I didn't give you that. Man gave you that, mm. you know. I gave yeah. you marriage, you know. And well, I, think, I think that's the same thing, argument you use against polygamy. Well, marriage is supposed to be a uh, picture of Christ in the church, isn't it? Right. That's it's right. A, Absolutely. It's, you, know, you know, to get into typology. Right. Um, so I think that's kind of the thing there is we're supposed to be faithful to, or if, if I was married, I would, I'm supposed to be faithful to my wife as right. Christ is faithful to his church. Right. And when you muddy the waters with, you know, polygamy or you commit adultery or you marry same sex it it kind of it isn't an accurate picture of christ in the church right. i think that's one of the bigger issues there well let's get back to you i want to ask um uh you know we were kind of going down this path you know i've always heard that kids their first nine years of life are the most formative mm. of their life and do you think it um, well, we've kind of addressed this, but do you think the absence of a father is very important in terms of how we go down that road? Uh, now, and I'm not just talking about males. I'm talking about females. I, I kind of look at I kind of look at lesbianism as being a very anti-male thing because some somewhere along the line, a ma a man hurt them in some way you know whether their father was not there for them emotionally physically um you know um maybe abused them ab you abused them sexually or whatever you know yeah the the um the father figure is uh, oh i guess you know in secular terms they call it daddy issues <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um uh, there's always uh, I th I think it's really um, it really boils down to um, a a issue with authority, um, and with the father being the authoritative figure in the home, it, he gets blamed a lot for uh, for this this um, choice to have an an issue with authority, but. Um, with with saying that, I believe that humans by nature have a dish, have an issue with authority. We don't want to listen to what anybody has to say about anything that we're doing. We want to be able to make our own choice based on how we feel, based on what makes us feel good, and not think about anything else. Um, whether it dishonors our parents, whether it would please God, um, whatever the case may be. When I was growing up, uh, my dad was out of the scene um, by the time I was four. Um, he wasn't around, but I have other experiences that kind of um, uh, helped to mold uh, what was what was happening in my life. I, by age nine, I had multiple um, uh, sexual encounters with older individuals already. Uh, one now, was this forced upon you or consensual? yeah one was uh one was when i was four was right. uh, by a young man that was uh six years older than me 
um, I, I would view that as um, sexual molestation. Right. Um, the later ones were basically just uh, uh, boys, uh, boys that um, uh, coerced me or um, uh, convinced me to do certain things with them. Um, but there was one uh, during that time that uh, made our friendship a uh, condition of, of that. And so coming out of that into uh, high school years and then college, I had a very warped perception of what true friendship was. Right, right. Um, so it wasn't really, uh, I would have to say that it wasn't really until um, in my later adult years that I really fully understood what it meant to actually just have a friend, how you could actually be um, intimate with someone who was a friend without actually being sexually active with them. Right. Do you take the traditional uh, definition of molestation as being um, where, you know, until you become an adult, adult of age, you know, legal age, where things are happening to you from an older, an older boy, for instance, that is there a younger age for you where you felt it was, it's, um, it was not molestation? Well, I, I can say that I didn't really feel like I had a, a choice in the matter when I was four. Um, but as I got older in my, adol- not in my adolescence, but in my grade school years experience that I had, I had a choice. When, when the situation was presented to me, I had a choice that I had to make. I guess what I'm getting at is do you, you had a choice, but do you think you had a full concept of yourself as a person? You know, in a traditional sense of, you know, where as an adult you sort of have a a concept of uh, who you are and what you should be doing or not doing. Whereas we are younger, you know, it, it could just be a molestation and, and you're not fully uh, cognitive of what is actually happening to you and what full choices you have. Yeah, I think um, as I was it, like in the middle of my development, like I would say like around uh, like ni- like ages 9 to 12, um, I would say that it was more or less the uh, like peer pressure in a sense where I was kind of pressured into certain activities with certain friends. Um, but the uh, but the choice was ultimately mine. Um, but there uh, and 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 I was always was it always with an older person? Mm-mm. No. Was, okay. Yeah. The only the only time it was with an older person was that was that first time, and I actually um, had mentally uh, blocked that out in my subconscious, and that actually did I didn't even actually remember it until when I was like thirteen or fourteen years old. It came out in a counseling session that I was in. But going back to that, do you do you think, let's say, for not not your experience, but for another person, would that be molestation, you know, with an older person, with the younger person? Yeah. Or, you know, up to the age of, you know, 16 or 18 or, you know. I mean, I would I would think that no matter what the age span is, is if uh, someone uses the authoritative position of being older than another person, then it is... I would view it as molestation. Okay. It wouldn't have to be like, for example, it doesn't have to be a 50-year-old man who's uh, diddling around with a 12-year-old boy. Mm-hmm. I mean, it could be a 12-year-old boy who's pursuing a 4-year-old boy, right. uh, whether for uh, just uh, grooming or or whatever the case may be. But In essence, you know. I guess ultimately, and I've heard this said before, is that homosexuality is where a man can't relate to another man unless it's in a sexual way. Um, I would say that uh, for quite some time, you know, in my um, in my teenage years and, and in my college years, that I had a really, really hard time actually communicating with other men just on the basis of friendship um, and not viewing them as uh, sexual conquest or a possible partner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you... Oh, go ahead. You said earlier, it sounded like you were um, kind of on the fence maybe or, you know, the way you were describing it. When you were responding to what you preach and what you tell people as opposed to, you said, you you know, to get more um, uh, deeper into it, you know, for this, the purpose of, the, of what we're doing today. So um, do you... Um, well, I'll, I'll come back to this later. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, uh, okay. Well, I was so entranced in what you were saying. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it. <laughs> uh, um, I will say this, and I'm not going to say who it was, but 
uh, I think I may have been molested when I was a kid, and like you, I think I blocked it out. Now it wasn't it wasn't my parents or anything like that, but mm-hmm. um, how how do you get these? How, how can do you have to be put under hypnosis to? Um, you said you found that you remembered it in counseling. How, who who's good at making you remember those things? Um, I actually, um, experienced it because, um, of a situation that I was in where I duplicated the, um, the, I duplicated the action. So it was something that was, conti- that, that became part of my, my story. Um, okay. so I was 12 years old, um, and I approached someone of like four or five years old, um, and was grooming them for activities and they told their parents. And it happened oh, to be a pastor. Uh, it happened to be my pastor at the time. And um, and uh, and so they, they, they showed grace and mercy and were willing to um, get me assist, get me help and, and um, point me in the direction of counseling and that sort of thing. And that's where um, the uh, experience of uh, being molested when I was much younger came out. Yeah. Okay. And and the the um, the therapist just started to ask me questions, you know, like you know what what do you feel could have caused you to do this? Uh, what um, uh, you know is this a learned behavior? Is this a you know just and and as we got in deeper, it was and it just, I mean, it came flood right. it came flooding back from us, I guess, from my subconscious where I had just suppressed it. And you know, I it, don't no, was that therapist Christian based or was it? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Everything was kind of one-sided for you. What I, what I mean is uh, your dad wasn't there. Um, and the, the, the alcohol and drugs were, were reactive to suppress the, the I think for, I got from you, you know, the other things, which typically they are. They're, they're, they are uh, responses to things that people experience, mm-hmm. you know, alcohol and drugs, escaping and, and uh, getting rid of the pain and stuff like that. But everything that happened to you and, and the whole path, uh, the Boy Scouts and, and all of that stuff, leads towards, towards uh, homosexuality. And, and uh, do, you, do you think, do you, when, when you think about that concept, do you, what do you think about p- people, the opposite? What do you think about people just being uh, inherently born into it? And not having a predisposition for it, and not um, a choice, you know, that that other factor. It's it's pro- it's probably difficult for you because everything was the all the cards are falling the other way for you. Everything, from what you're telling me, yeah, leads to that typical path of of going down. Even the therapist, being a Christian. That's why I asked. Being a Christian therapist. Um, they're supposed to be even-minded, but but a Christian therapist is still going to lean towards towards comps, concepts that they and questions that they ask you, and lead you down those roads of of how they're exploring uh, to find out what's going on with you. Um, everybody's biased to some degree, and a right. therapist is still going to be biased. You know, on a Christian-based therapist is going to be somewhat biased. I I believe just like anybody else would towards leading down that path of, of you know their, their beliefs falling into their questions and how they explore what's happening with you. So everything you've told me is, is leaning down that other direction. And I'm, I'm asking because I don't know, um, you know, Greg and I differ on, on this, you know, about, about uh, uh, being predisposed, you know, or, or not, you know, or learned and, and choice. So I want to know more about what you, what you think about that. Well, it's like I said, <clears throat> and I know it's difficult because yeah, you're and and then the ultimate irony is you became uh, a preacher, you know, and everything is in is in the opposite direction. So I'm kind of asking you to look at the opposite, in which I know you have, sure, you know, and I want to know more about what you think, really think about that. 
Well, I kind of look look back over my journey and my past. Like I said uh, earlier, that um, I believe that uh, the enemy is very strategic in his attack. Mm-hmm. Um, and I believe that he takes, um, he doesn't have foreknowledge like God has. He's not omnipotent. He doesn't know everything. He doesn't know things that, um, are going to happen before they happen. But I think, uh, I, but I, I can, I can see where, uh, over the course of my journey that, um, as each thing happened, um, uh, in, in, in my journey, in my timeline, as I was growing up, then, uh, the enemy brought these other um, uh, outside forces and other um, um, pivotal moments where I had choices to make um, that would lead me down uh, the path to living a homosexual lifestyle. Um, I mean, such as obviously when I was molested when I was four, that wasn't a choice. That was something that just happened to me. Um, well, then um, you move forward to uh, it was really hard for me to make friends when I was in grade school. Like I didn't have a lot of friends. Okay. So the enemy, uh, then took that and, and perverted it into having, uh, friends come along that wanted me to, um, do, uh, sexual experimentations with them. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, this guy, this, I finally have a friend, you know, I finally have somebody that wants to hang out with me that wants to spend the night together wants to, you know, do things together. But it was always, uh, circled around, uh, this, this sexual experimentation with this individual. Um, and then, uh, you know, as I got older in, into my adolescence and my teen years, my best fr- one of my best friend in high school turned out to be someone who wanted to experiment in in sexual things, and we were never sexually intimate. But he he would le- he led me in the direction to find others to be sexually intimate with, and then you fast forward from that point to uh, my, a friend of mine that um, uh, was my best friend from church, and um, we spent a lot of time together. Uh, and so the enemy attacked him and, and made him question um, his sexuality and the direction that he wanted to go, and that caused him to ask me questions. Well, then that caused me to pursue him as uh, as a sexual conquest. So if you if you can see this this web that's kind of being uh, that's kind of being formed, and um, it actually continued even on to uh, college. When I got to college, I had some really, I mean. And I always say this when I'm telling my testimony live. I always, you know, I'll, I'll I have to say I had some really screwed up experiences with men, and um, I never had any relationships that really worked out all that great. And then, you know, all the ladies in the room will laugh, and I turn and look at them. I say, well, "What do you guys like?" Or, 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 or I'm sorry, I got that backwards. When I was in college, I had two really, uh, really screwed up relationships with women, and you know, the guys in the room laughing I said what are you guys laughing about you know I batted for both teams at one point or another (laughs) I mean I have experience on both sides of the fence I I mean I had just as much you know just as many uh poor experiences and screwed up experiences and relationships with men as I did with women you know and so if you if you fast forward to like college years I had two really just uh, just really weird um dating experiences when i was a freshman in in college and and so that was that was uh, what kind of sealed the deal for me i was like well this is too difficult it's just it's just for me i was just saying this is just too difficult so for me i took out yeah like a cop out like so so i um so about sophomore year of college, I finally just kind of uh, walked in, uh, walked into it, and started to embrace um, the thoughts and the feelings that I was having. Started to tell people that I went to college with, and I went to a Christian university. I went to a, I went to a Christian university, mm-hmm. and I, you know uh, the friends that I told obviously they didn't tell um, uh, you know the dean or or, or other people, but um, I began to come uh, you know come out of the closet to my friends uh, so to speak or whatever, and um, I actually found acceptance in the in the community the community that I was in. Uh, I had friends that were you know I thought you know some of my friends I thought I was going to tell them and they weren't going to want to be my friends anymore, but um, finally these were friends that weren't making sexual demands on me. They're there wasn't there wasn't um, a hidden agenda of, as right. to why they wanted to be friends with me. So I thought that I could go out here and I could be sexually active, um, how I felt led to be sexually active. But then I could also have uh, I also have these Christian friends that uh, I didn't have to be sexually active with, and they still wanted to uh, they still they still wanted to be friends with me. Right. And so um, if you can kind of see this huge web that's uh, that's that's being woven um, uh, by uh, enemy attack by 
by. He was um, confusing you, and God is not the author of confusion. Right. Well, I mean, it's it's, it's, it's a mixture of it's a mixture of enemy attack. It's a mixture right. of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Just right. just uh, things happening to you because you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right. Because bad things happen to good people. Yeah. I mean, you know, why did this person die? Well, I mean, things happen. Right. There are choices that other people make that affect people who are good or people who are on the right path that right. get them on the wrong path. But the ultimate. Um, the ultimate culminated point is, is they have a choice. Yeah. Like, like when I got to that point, I had those bad experiences with those two, um, college girlfriends. I mean, I had a choice. I had a choice to either continue down, um, uh, the more developed road and, and, and find a female that I could relate to, um, you know, on, on an intimate level, I'm not saying I was looking for a sexual partner at a Christian school that was a female cause I wasn't, but, um, I had a choice to continue pursuing relationships that led down uh, that road or get, uh, get offended or make, make another choice to, uh, to go down another path. And I made that choice to, to go down that path. And that, that's where, uh, really where the drugs started to come in really, really heavy was when I made that final choice and, and, and embraced, um, homosexuality as the choice that I was making, because I knew growing up fundamentally that, um, uh, homosexuality was a sin. I knew what the Bible said. I didn't need any church groups or any Christians to come and tell me, well, it says this in scripture, such and such. I knew what they were. I knew what the word said. I knew, um, uh, I knew that it was a Genesis two. um, um, uh, uh, issue. I knew the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. I knew, uh, you know, I knew what it says in Philippians about guarding your heart. I knew all of these things, but, um, I had made this choice based on the experiences that had happened to me in my life because to go the other direction was too much effort for me. But in that point in my process, I was trying to do it all myself. Right. I was trying to do it all myself. I wasn't uh, relying on the power of God or the presence of the Lord in my life or anything um, to to fuel to fuel my um, my thought patterns or my uh, my love languages or uh, my sexual desires in a different in a different direction. And um, that goes for anybody, even even just a, a regular young college guy who is struggling with, uh, you know, uh, fornicating in his mind over women that he sees in class. Right, you know, it's the right. same situation. It's, right. you know, is he going to fight that urge Give to just to lay down with yeah. every piece of whatever he finds right. or is he going to stay the course and rely on the Lord for strength and right. for um, a way out of that temptation when it comes right. and stay the course and 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 focus on the things of God and focus on what God wants him to do which is saving himself for his wife and 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 not uh, defiling his his own body and and, and these sort of things yeah. but in my mind in my development I took the easy way out it was easy for me to be attracted to men. It was easy for me to want to have sex with men. It was easy for me to want to be in relationship with men that led to that led to uh, sexual encounters with them. So I embraced that because the other direction was too hard. But in order to go in the other direction, because my process had been perverted by the enemy, it would have taken me relying on the presence of the Holy Spirit wow. and surrendering my life completely to the Lord and to His and to His will in order to. Uh, be successful in that and I was not ready I, I was not at a point where I was ready to do that I want to get into go ahead all right, real quick just but overall it sounds uh, your decisions were, were based on situation and circumstance and and what about the actual desire at at, at those those you know those, oh there was a desire no I mean desire for heterosexual or, or no f- never okay um, so you you did this decision based on on um, uh, following God's God's will. What do you mean? To uh, for a heterosexual heterosexual relationship. Well, I don't really. A lot of people view it when you come out of homosexuality as a, oh they turn straight. I don't view it as a gay straight thing. I view it as an obedient and disobedient thing. The word of God says to lie down with someone of the same sex is to be disobedient unto the spirit of God. Um, and so it's more about obedience versus disobedience than it is about s- straight or gay. So it would be suppressing certain desires? Oh, I don't suppress my desires at all. The Lord suppresses them. He removes them from me okay. when I'm focused on uh, when I'm focused on uh, the things of God. He uh, keeps my path clear and straight. 
Now, if I sat here and told you that I've that uh, 11 years ago, I turned my life and my and my will over uh, to the Lord and I've never had a temptation. and I've never had a thought. I'd be lying to you. I struggle with memory and past experiences all the time. Right. Um, uh, the enemy brings them up in my mind. It's like a freaking circus parade 24 seven going around the front of my mind. And I have a cognitive choice whether I'm going to pull a monkey off of the circus train and play with it, or I'm going to leave the monkey in the cage. I mean, you've got a lot. You've got that. And then you've got um, alcohol drug addiction, which is extremely powerful, you know. You but but I, 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 I celebrate, uh, I just celebrated um, 11 successful years this past January without a drink or a drug. That's great. Without any relapse. And so um, yeah. I hear a lot of people that, that do a lot of, of teaching and a lot of encouraging out there that say you cannot, uh, you cannot conquer drugs and alcohol without relapse as part of your recovery. And I, don't, uh. I just don't believe that. Now for me to sit here and tell you that I haven't thought about using over, the, over, the, over those years, or there haven't been moments where I've come close to using, I'd be lying to you because I can think about three or four scenarios right now that I could share with you where I came very close to picking up a drink or a drug. Um, I, I, for the purpose of the time, I, I just want to, I, I do want to go over one more thing and I want to then get in kind of more what caused you to change your life around. Um, uh, this is one thing that, you know, and, and then the argument whether it's a choice or not, people will say, well, that, that person was born uh, with mannish characteristics. If you're a woman, and this guy over here was, you know, he's always been effeminate, you know. Um, and I think to myself, well, wait a minute. Uh, I can remember when it, the first time when uh, I found out that Rock Hudson was. Uh, homosexual and that he had AIDS, you know, uh, I thought, whoa, uh, Rock Hudson, you know, this dude's the epitome of a sex symbol on the screen, you know, he's, ma- he's macho and blah, blah, blah. It was hard to, it was a hard pill to take, you know. Um, and you I, liked, you liked him. <laughs> 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 but, um, but anyway, um, uh, you have to forgive him, but anyway, um, um, then I, you know, I've seen, I've, I've, I've seen women who are mannish that are happily married heterosexuals, and I've seen effeminate men who are happily married, uh, you know, uh, straight men, straight guys. Hetero, okay? huh? Is the word you're looking for hetero? Yeah, hetero, whatever. <laughs> um, but I've also seen in my own life. Um, I remember. Again, I won't say who this is, but I saw, I knew of a person who had married a friend, uh, a person I knew, and when she married him, she was every, you know, to me, looked like a typical woman, you know, and the way she acted, femininity and the whole bit. If you saw her today, because she surrendered to the lesbian lifestyle, you would you would think she always looked very mannish, you know. Um, and I also know a, a male homosexual who um, I knew him when he was in a heterosexual relationship years ago. And the last thing in the world I would ever think that he was a homosexual. Now uh, he's about as effeminate as you can get, you know. Uh, they call that, uh, you know, flamboyant, you know. Um and you were talking about the enemy. I personally, I think this is what the enemy does to people. You know, it can literally change your appearance. You know, if you if you surrender to to that lifestyle, do you would you agree with that? Well, it's an identification issue, Greg. Yeah, um, it, it's a uh, when people step into the LGBT uh, lifestyle, uh, they choose to. Um, it would be the same as like if, for example. Um, let's take my father, for instance. Right. He's an Elvis impersonator, right? right? He could very well choose to be an Elvis impersonator on stage and be Mike Myers right. in real life, but right. he chooses not to be. Right. He portrays himself as Elvis 24-7. Right. He is completely engulfed in it. He dresses like Elvis. Right. Everything that he does is like Elvis. He wears sunglasses. He wear, he's he got things marked, uh, you know, taking care of business mm-hmm. um, on his car, on his, I mean, on, on everything. I mean, everything is... 
is at Elvis level. So he has really um, used his um, his career to identify who he is. So in, in life, we can choose to identify ourselves based on whatever platform we want to identify ourselves. Okay, I could use the current fact that I'm a pastor and I could use that as my primary identification, but I don't. My primary identification is a child of God who is passionately and romantically in love with Jesus. Right. That's my identity. Right. My identity is not pastor of a church. That's something that I do. Right. My identity is I'm a child of God. My identity is I am uh, saved, sanctified, and redeemed by the blood of Christ. That's my identity. And so, um, and even so, when I was living in the, uh, in the, in the homosexual lifestyle, it, my identity was the homosexual lifestyle everywhere that I went supported the, the, the agenda everywhere that I ate, everywhere that I shopped, I wore clothing that supported the agenda. I acted, talked, walked, dressed, um, hung out with only people who supported the agenda. Um, I went to gay pride marches. I, you know, all of these things, everything that I did focused on that one por- portion of my life. It would be the same, the same scenario as if, you know, a guy was a, a sex crazed maniac for women and everything that he did focused on that, that sex craze. So he went to strip bars. He, um, trolled on the internet. He, uh, was on, uh, I don't know, Tinder grinder whatever whatever they have now these yeah. days <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure uh, you know I've, I've kind of gone past I've kind of gone past all of that but he dressed he, he dressed in a certain way to pick up certain uh, kinds of women he did you know his job was uh, you, you know all of these mm-hmm. different things um, so you can become what you think you can basically. become I mean you can identify your life right however you choose to identify. Right, but um, today I choose to identify my, my life based on the righteousness of Christ versus the uh, the desires of my flesh. Yeah. And I'm not sitting here telling you that I want to go sleep with a man today because right, I don't. Right, right. Um, I d- today I do not have a desire uh, to have a homosexual right. relationship. Today I do not have a desire to use drugs. Today right. I do not have a desire um, to drink alcohol. Today right. I do not have a desire to cheat on my wife. Right. Ask me another day, the 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 answers might be different. Does that change what God did in my life? No. Right. It just means that I have a stupid brain who has stupid thoughts sometimes. Yeah, I mean, and you you can be a, a yeah, the most loyal husband in the world, the most uh, best Christian in the world if you're straight and still have those same ideas coming through your mind, especially if you lived that lifestyle before you right. came to Christ. You know, right. it'd be the same thing. You know? Right. It's just, it all boils down to what are you going to choose to identify your life to right, right. And I say this from the pulpit all the time when I, when I share my testimony, when I preach, I, I would be lying if I didn't tell you there are some days that I wake up, I get out of bed and I go into the bathroom and I pee in the toilet and then I look in the mirror and all I see is a 42 year old gay man that, ran, that, that made the wrong choice. But if I get out my Bible, that's not what the word of God tells me I am. Right, right. The Word of God tells me that I am highly favored. Right. The Word of God tells me that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The Word right. of God tells me that I am seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus and that I am the righteousness of God. Right. So in that moment, I have the choice to look at my reflection in the mirror and believe and identify myself based on how I feel. Right. Or identify my base, identify myself based on what God says about me. Right, right. Which what God says about me is eternal. Right. What I feel is temporal. Well, I want to bring up one thing since we're on these kind of subjects. As, uh, uh, you know, is uh, what? How do you feel about the transgender movement? Uh, you know, I recently had a um, um, through my employment. Uh, it was called cultural diversity. And uh, again, I'm a very uh, politically incorrect type person, but <laughs> they. <laughs> no way. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they had in there that I could be disciplined if I referred to someone who had been assigned male at birth or female at birth as the way they had been assigned rather than what they wanted to be called. 
okay, which I think is totally ridiculous. Okay, to me, if uh, if if Jimmy over here walked up to me and said, I, "I am Napoleon Bonaparte. I was born Napoleon Bonaparte. I've always been Napoleon Bonaparte." I'd call the state mental hospital and have him checked out. Okay. Uh, to me, I don't see any difference. That's not very about, tolerant. Huh? That's not very tolerant. Um, I don't see any difference. Somebody coming up to me and saying, well, I've always been a girl. If they're a man, I've always been a girl. Um, I was born a girl. Uh, I'm a, I'm a girl trapped in a man's body. You know, to me, it's 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 a mental illness you know it's it's i've even heard experts talking about it that it's tied in with the same mental illness that um is is uh, related to an anorexia say it for me uh, anorexia a anorexia say it again uh <laughs> no say it again so i can edit anorexia it. Say it without laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Where, you know, somebody uh, looks in the mirror and I see a fat person. Right. Oh, body and dysmorphia? Is that, what yeah. is it? Body dysmorphia. Yeah, okay, there you go. Um, that uh, they see a fat person when they're, when they're actually starving themselves to death. Right. Okay. Now, we can get away with, uh, as a society, by giving in to their feelings, okay, because it's not it's not necessarily killing them, you know. If you did that to someone who was anorexic, they would probably put you on trial for murder because you helped talk them into starving themselves to death. Oh yeah, yeah, you're really fat, you know. When you see before them that they're, uh, you know, I, I think to a certain extent as a society we've gone nuts you know <laughs> i mean i just wanted to bring that up I, we don't have to get in a big discussion about that but i mean I, I didn't know what your feelings were on that you know but so what was the question i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> there was you, a question you just want me to address somewhere? the issue or well or was i mean a specific... what do you feel do you agree do you with feel? me or mm -hmm. uh, i've had a lot of friends in the past that um have been uh, uh drag queens entertainers uh, right um or they are um uh, female impersonators. I mean, right. there there are all these different um, categories, right. if you will, that right. um, the uh, homosexual community puts on uh, individuals who uh, want to dress as opposite gender. Right. Um, I have never really had any um, encounters with with. Um, well, that's not true. I had one friend uh, when I was in the uh, homosexual lifestyle that was a performer. Um, was a, a female impersonator and went on to have the full um, surgery and now lives as a woman in right. uh, California. I can't even, I, I, I have a really hard time wrapping my, my, my brain around it because even though I lived in the homosexual community and lived a homosexual lifestyle and um, um, had sexual experiences with men, I never, I've never once wanted to be a woman. Right, right. Um, I've never wanted to date uh, someone who impersonated a woman. It's never it's never been one of my desires. So when I was living the homosexual the homosexual lifestyle, I dated men. Yeah. Period. Um, when I came out of the homosexual lifestyle, I dated women. Period. Yeah. Uh, there was no there no in between. And and you've met my wife. There's right. there's right. there's really not a masculine physically not a, one single masculine trait about her at all. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. mean, th there's just not. She's a beautiful um, woman. She is. Yeah, yeah. She's a knockout for sure. Yeah. Um. Uh. You know, that's a that's the other great thing is is the Lord set her aside for me. Kelly had never been married. She'd never been. You, you, you know, when I came out of my my junk when I was 31, I'm 43 now or almost 43 now. I thought, you know, there's there's not gonna be there's not gonna be anybody left. Who I mean, who am yeah. I gonna settle down with? I'm gonna settle down with someone who's got baggage, that's been married a couple of times, uh, probably maybe has a couple of kids. I'm gonna be the stepdad. I'm gonna be this. I'm gonna be that. Uh, but you know, the Lord, the Lord, um, just uh, the Lord just set her aside for me. That's right. exactly what happened. Right. Um, but I don't I don't really claim to to know or understand. Um, uh, what people are thinking and and uh, why they would do that, um, but uh, I just I just boil it back to the scripture. I just boil it back to the scripture. In Genesis, um, the Bible says that um, God created 
man in his own image. Right. Male and female, he created them. Right. Now, when we're talking about uh, the difference between being created and being born, being separate, right? Right, right. Okay? You can't undo something that's created. Right. Now, you a, a tree is created by God. I guess you can cut it down and you can burn it. But right. um, just because you burn it doesn't change the fact that it's a tree. It's now right. just a burnt tree. Right, right. Um, so you can take whatever gender you want to and alter it as much as you want to. But when you do a blood test... The blood test is still going to come back male. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today, 50 years from now, I don't care how many hormones you pump in. Right. The blood test is still going to come back male. Right. There's no way that you can change right. that. Right. You can do whatever you want to. It just bothers me is that we're getting to a point where you can be disciplined by a company. And there is even people trying to get it passed in the law that you can go to jail at some point. If you were, if you don't refer to a person, then they're, um, you know, the way they want to be referred. To. Well, I don't think they're trying to get it to where you can take it, uh, take it to jail, but they are trying to get it to where that individual can sue can can sue you in civil court. Yeah, but so even they can that use to it me as is slander. Wrong. Yeah. It, it would be viewed as slander. Right. Yeah. It, even that to me is is wrong. And, sure. And uh, uh, and don't get me wrong. I mean, if if a transgender, we we have, <laughs> well, uh, let me rephrase that. Uh, I know of uh, a transgender person, um, and I've always been nice to him and everything. I would never do anything to hurt hurt their feelings, you know. Um, but uh, and and you know if they want to be called uh, Alice or Marie or whatever, you know, what, um, you know, uh, I'll call them Alice Marie, you know. But if if a rubber meets the road and I'm forced to say, well, that's not a man I'm talking to, um, then I, I guess I'm gonna have to risk going to jail or being sued sure. or, or or whatever. I'm not going to play this this game we got going right. on in society, and that's yeah. all I'm saying. Well, know? it's the same as uh, like my wife and I. We have we have a non we have a nonprofit five hundred one c three ministry where we go around we tell our story we co we co speak right. we co teach we co preach. Um, I share my music um, and all this sort of thing. And I've had people ask me over the years, you know, um, uh, what's going to happen when um, they say that you can't be a nonprofit if you don't accept certain lifestyles? Yeah. Well, my ministry will become a for-profit ministry right, right. <laughs> um, because I will never stop um, encouraging or uh, being a caveat. And that's for, the kind of thing I'm talking about. I never you know. even thought of that loophole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, at, at we some make money now. I mean, yeah, you can lose, point, yeah. actually, it could come to the point where you could lose your tax exempt status and all this stuff. Oh you know? yeah, they can have the church's tax exempt yeah. status, and they can yeah. have. If you're listening, you can have my ministry's tax exempt status. Right. We don't even really use it that much right. anyway. Right. Uh, when when we go to the store and we go to buy things, or we're on a ministry right. trip, we, we pay gas on our meals. We 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 don't carry our our tax exempt form yeah. around uh, with us like a trophy. Yeah. Um, now, if it's a large purchase, it's going to save the ministry some money, um, and the the money that we saved can be better steward, stewarded towards something else. Then, right. then absolutely, we'll take advantage of that. But we're not set up at you know Kroger, Kroger Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, all right. these different merchants to where we walk in, they're like, oh, here comes the tax free <laughs> people. You know, we don't, we just right. don't, we don't do that. Okay, well, I, uh, I want to go on to. I now, from what I understand, I believe you told me, or maybe my wife told me that in your testimony that uh, jail was a turning point for you. How did, first of all, how did you get arrested, oh. and why did you get arrested, and <laughs> and what impact did that have on your life? Well, yeah. I had this very um, bad habit and these very poor choices that I made, and it was called drinking and then choosing to drive. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> and I did this repetitively on a regular basis, and um, there on more than one occasion was pulled over and was arrested for DUI. Um, actually have uh, been arrested for DUI twice. Um, act- actually have been in handcuffs seven times and arrested five times, wow. uh, but only, only twice was for a DUI. The other times were for... Um, 
Uh, it's contributing to the delinquency of a minor, I think, was one. Um, disturbing the peace at IHOP a couple of times was <laughs> another. Um, yeah. You know, um, I got oh, wow. arrested for reckless driving one time. Yeah. Um, like, and take that to Waffle House. <laughs> yeah, take that to Waffle House. It's not, yeah, well, IHOP's where the police officers go. Now, I don't have anything against police officers. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're, um, uh, I have a lot of respect for them. They definitely do a job that I do not want to do. I do not want to, I do not want to be dealing with people all day that used to act the way that I acted. But, right. um, in 2009, um, I was at a really low point. Um, I had basically, uh, not basically I had lost everything. I mean, my family was gone except for my mom. Um, all of my friends were gone. Um, even my best friend that I hung out with on a, on on a regular on a regular basis, my my biggest using buddy, my my biggest uh, um, uh, go around person, uh, didn't want to come around that much because I was using at a capacity um, that was uh, just not tolerable by anyone. It was just not tolerable by, by anyone. Um, I was I was also dealing on a on a very high level at the time as well, and had had gotten to the point to where even the people who bought from me did not want to come buy from me anymore because of the way that I was acting and the, at the level in which I was con- consuming drugs, and so. Um, I got uh, charged with DUI second offense, and um, there was no way out of it. Uh, I didn't have a leg to stand on, my lawyer said, and so um, I was going to have to se- to uh, serve some time in jail. And I actually attempted suicide the night before I had to turn myself in. Um, and some people would say, "Oh, you just you know you took the drugs that you had," but no, I took them. Um, with the hope and the intention that I would not be alive in the morning. And so I can't even tell you what was in my box where I kept my stuff, but everything that was in there, I ate it, and I did it, and I snorted it, and I smoked it, and I did all of it the night did before. Did you end up in the hospital? Um, I did not end up in the hospital. The crazy <laughs> thing about it was is I woke up the next morning to my mom shaking me on the couch, and I literally remember, part of my language, I literally remember being pissed off that I was still there. I mean, I was so I was so mad, um, and so my mom took me to uh, to the courthouse, and and um, I pled guilty and signed, and uh, I walked in with nothing because I knew I was going straight into custody after that, and so I spent forty five days in jail in Davidson County for a DUI offense. Again, based on the things that I've done in my life, I mean, at one point I was one of the largest drug dealers in the Nashville area. If you were getting something on a weekend, you were getting it from me. And I don't say that to brag. I just say that to kind of give you an idea of, of where I've come from and what I've been through. Um, but I should be, I should have spent a whole lot more time in jail than what, what kind I spent. Of, what kind of drugs were you dealing? Uh, ecstasy, um, uh, uh, prescription drugs, um, uh, crack, um, crystal meth, cocaine. You're lucky you didn't get caught with that. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. If I'd gotten caught with uh, crystal meth or uh, any levels of cocaine that I was uh, that I was selling at the time, I definitely would have been, you know, serving 10 to 10 to 15 for sure. Okay, so you were dealing with all this heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so and I was using most of those simultaneously. So the Lord Um, was looking out for you. even when You didn't realize it. Oh, most definitely. He's been looking out for me my whole life. I can't even, (laughs) we don't even have enough time to talk about all the times that I've come close to death and came out shining on the other side of it. But, uh, in 2009, so I went to, I went to jail for DUI second offense. And, uh, I remember, um, I was there, it was the third night I was there. I was dealing with withdrawals like nobody's business. Um, and that's primarily one of the reasons why I had continued to use. I was already at the point where I did not want to use anymore. But the pain of getting sober was greater than the pain of staying high. So I, I experienced pain and discomfort regardless of what I was doing. So I was in pain when I was high and I was in pain when I detoxed. But the pain of being high was less than the pain of, of trying to get sober. And so I remember waking up in the middle of the night, the third night I was in jail. Um, and I remember just, I just remember saying, oh my God, I'm going to die if this pain doesn't go away. And so um, I... And they say that the only prayer of an unrighteous man is the prayer of repentance. Well, I'm, I'm proof that that's not true. Yeah. Um, 
and that is not that is not scripture in the Bible. That's a phrase that that it was uh, you that was right. made off of off of the scripture. But um, uh, so it was third night. I was in jail. I was laying there, and I just said, God, I, if you don't take this pain away from me, I'm going to die from withdrawals. I'm going to die here in this jail from withdrawing from crack and uh, crystal meth and ecstasy and and everything that I was on at the time. I said, if you just take my pain away, I'll listen. It's all I said. And I, I clearly remember I passed out I, after that. After I said that prayer, I passed out because the pain had gotten more than 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 what I could uh, stand. The next morning, I woke up and all of the detox pain was gone. Wow! Man. And I have not suffered from one detox um, a side effect since then. Um, and that same morning, I woke up and I stood up, and there were all these granules of dirt in my bed. After I got up so much to the point to where I brushed them off on the floor and then walked across it with bare feet. And it felt like when you spill salt on the kitchen floor. Uh, so this is what happened the third night I was in jail. Okay. So obviously the, obviously the Lord had my attention at that point. Right. So if you fast forward, um, about another week and a half to two weeks, um, it was about three o'clock in the morning. Um, and, uh, I woke up out of a dead sleep and it, it and if for those of you that are out there listening that may have spent some time in jail, you, you know what I mean when I talk about jailhouse noise. Uh, there's all this noise that goes on all through the night. Toilets running, water dripping, somebody next to you snoring, somebody talking in their sleep. Um, you know, um, a correctional officers coming in and out the door, doors slamming, blankets rustling. I mean, you got we're living in, we're living in a bunkhouse with like uh, 50 or 60 other men all in this 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 big bunkhouse. And, um, you know, people are, you know, CEOs are now, actually. Were you in a jail situation or a prison situation? Ja- just jail. just jail, county okay. jail, yeah. Okay. Long long term, uh, uh, I was in um, I was in um, strict lockdown because for uh, two weeks because uh, I had never been to never been to jail before. Um, a lot of times you can get into the low security uh, portion of the jail after about three days if you've been incarcerated before and you had good behavior. So I'd never been before, so I had to stay the maximum amount of that time in the, you know, you walk up and down the hallway with handcuffs on and, and all this sort of stuff if you're outside your cell, your cell block. Um, so it was uh, about 3 o'clock in the morning. I woke up, set up out of a dead sleep. Um, I remember that the second hand on the clock was not even moving. So there was a clock up on the wall. So the clock was not even working. I mean, people will hear this testimony and they'll be like, oh, well, the battery went dead and they had to replace it, whatever the case may be. The toilets weren't running. There was no water dripping. The guy next to me who snored like a freight train was not even breathing. <laughs> not not kidding. Wow. Like literally could not hear him breathing yeah. next to me. I remember during the experience that a correctional officer came in the room and the door closed behind him and the door did not make a sound. Okay. And so during this experience, um, uh, I heard the voice of God and God said, uh, Jeremy, I have great, uh, or you know, he said, I have great and wonderful things planned for your life, but it's going to require you allowing me to change what you've done, the choices that you've made, reroute, I mean, just rewire, you know, the way that you've uh, chosen to live your life. And, you know, me and my arrogance and, you know, I, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm a real, if you, if you stick around me long enough, you'll find out that I have a really uh, sarcastic sense of humor. So uh, I'm always saying something sarcastic. So I'm like, oh, well, you know, God, if that was you, uh, speak again. And so he said the same thing again, but the fir- but instead of saying it the same way he said it the first time, he uh, capped the front of it with my name. And he said my name. And I've never experienced anything like this ever again as long as I've lived. Um, and he, he, he said, Jeremy, I have great, wonderful things planned for you, but it's going to require you allowing me to change everything that you've done to your life. Um, and it was in that moment that, uh, I knew that I had come in contact with the creator of the universe and I knew that my life was, uh, out of control and unmanageable. And I knew that it, that now was the time. And so I surrendered, I surrendered the party lifestyle. I surrendered, um, the multiple sex partners I surrendered all the drugs, but I ended it with. You're not going to tell me who I can fall in love with. Now, that's what I told God. 
God of all the universe came down like burning bush experience. And I told him that he wasn't going to, that there was one area of my life that he wasn't going to manage. And, and what I meant by that was, is I was going to, I was going to hold on to uh, my same sex desires. And I was going to hold on to this, this dream, this vision, this fantasy that I was going to be able to uh, find a, uh, find a man and settle down and, and build a family and these sort of things. And so as we moved through time, I got out of jail and uh, I I started attending a church in Smyrna and I seriously thought in the back of my mind that uh, at one at some point I was going to be able to have a same-sex relationship and we were going to be able to go to church together and we were going to be able we were going to be accepted and we're just going to be like a normal couple you know and um, but I wasn't pursuing a relationship with anyone primarily because I was involved in AA and NA at the time and they um, uh, strictly encourage you to not be in a romantic um, sexual based relationship for at least one year after you get sober. So I, I and and I wanted to be sober at this point. I wanted to be sober. I did. I didn't want to use alcohol and drugs. I had desire to use, but I did not want to use alcohol and drugs. So I said, well, if I'm going to make this work, then I need to follow this program. And that's what I did. I went to outpatient. I went to an intensive outpatient uh, rehab program here in Murfreesboro called Pathfinders for about seven months. And then I went to one AA meeting and one NA meeting every day for a whole year. 365 AA meetings and 365 NA meetings in a year. I even went on Christmas Day to both groups. True story. I, I'm not making this up. Second year, I, you know, it became a uh, it became a little sporadic. So, um, so went to jail in January of 2009. Got out of jail in uh, mid February, late February of 2009. Uh, transformed, surrendered my drug addiction, surrendered my sexual addiction, surrendered my desire to look at pornography, surrendered all of these things, but told the Lord that I was going to continue pursuing same-sex relationships. But God, he had a different plan. Uh, So you fast forward in 2009 to about October, I was sitting um, in a church in Smyrna um, for a conference, listening to someone who was... um, uh, claiming to be delivered from homosexual lifestyle, a female claiming to be delivered from a lesbian lifestyle. And I'm sitting there in the church listening to her testimony. I remember sitting there thinking, come on, there's no way. You look masculine. You have a masculine haircut. Um, you're, you're dressed about as masculine as a woman can get without wearing dude's clothes. You're not married. Um, you're not telling me about any desires that you have for men. Um, and you're not currently in relationship with anybody. But you've been set free from this lesbian lifestyle. So she starts telling the, her testimony. And she uh, t- tells a story. She uh, went out uh, to the store, uh, went to a, I'm sorry, went to a service with a friend of hers who was a Christian. She tells a story about on the way home that the Holy Spirit and the Lord wrecked her so hard on the way home she had to pull the car over. And she said she heard the Lord tell her, just like I heard in, in the jail, that, she, that her life was out of control, but that he could bring it under control. And um, she prayed and she said, you know, this woman that I'm currently with, that I'm currently living with, is my partner. I love her. I care about her. I don't want to hurt her feelings. I cannot ask her to leave. So she told God, if you want me to pursue this new life with you, You'll tell my partner of seven years to leave. She got home from the, the service that she had went to. She walked in the front door, and her partner of seven years was standing in the middle of the living room with all of her suitcases packed and her stuff packed up in boxes, getting ready to start loading it into her car. She walked into the apartment and said, What are you doing? And she said, I'm leaving. And she said, Why are you leaving? She said, um, I'm not sure. I just know that I have to go. Wow. wow. And, and still yeah. to this day, to tell that story, it almost brings tears to my yeah. eyes. And so I just kind of brushed it off, and I thought, this lady's crazy. Yeah. So I had to leave the conference early that day because I had to go work. I was yeah. working at Demas's at the time yeah. in Murfreesboro. Yeah. And um, I left the conference, and I got to work. Man, I got so wrecked at work. Um, that I couldn't even focus over and over and over and over and over again. All I heard was the spirit of the Lord say, I want to do the same thing for you. I want to do the same thing for you. 
I want to do the same for you. I'm going to do the same for you. To the point where um, I actually got, I was supposed to close that night. I got somebody to, to, to take my closing shift for me so I could get out early. And I read on my little moped. I was riding a moped at the, at the time. And I, I drove my little moped back to my mom's house. And I barely just got pulled into the driveway. And I crawled off the moped. I remember falling to the floor as soon as I got in the back door of my mom's house. I crawled, literally crawled to my bedroom. And I, the carpet was still wet the next morning from my experience and I just cried out to the Lord and I and I told him I said you know uh, I don't know what it's supposed to look like or feel like to be attracted to a woman I don't know how you are going to keep me from being attracted to men or wanting to be in sexual relationship with men so if this is what you want for my life then you have to do it you have to do it um, and I can't really explain it but the next morning I woke up and Things were just different. Like the way that my mind operated, the way that my body moved, the way that I presented myself to other people was different. It, it, it was different. It was like, it wasn't Jeremy trying to over accentuate my feminine characteristics. It was the real Jeremy. It was just Jeremy being Jeremy. Now, of course, there, there it took a little bit of time for some of those overemphasized characteristics to uh to pull away and for my voice to deepen up and and that sort of thing because I had talked you know in a high-pitched voice like this and you know and and over emphasized things so much to a point that it became uh just part of my character and part of my natural um uh, uh, my natural uh, attitude my and my natural flow. Uh, but I woke up that next morning after that experience and something was just different. Like I didn't spend all day fantasizing over that per- that that man that I was going to meet that was going to give me everything that I didn't have. Um, and it was later that day um, that the Holy Spirit, um, and it's so unique that I, I've really learned how to discern between the difference of the Lord and the Holy Spirit and the Father, because um, they all three have very distinct different voices and very distinct specific approaches to us when 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 they minister to our hearts and our spirits. Um, I, I remember the Holy Spirit saying, uh, you've had all along what you were searching for. See, what I was searching for my whole life was a man that would give me everything that I ever wanted. That would love me, that would protect for me, protect me, that would provide for me, that would make me feel secure. I was always searching for a man that I could be romantically involved with, that I could be emotional with, that I could be intimate with. And the truth of the matter was, is I wasn't searching for that, um, I, I, that I wasn't searching for the wrong thing. I was just looking for the right thing in all the wrong places. Right. You know that old country song that says, looking for love in all the wrong you places. You were in a right, uh, right church, wrong pew. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> right church, wrong pew. And it was, that, it was in that moment that I realized that the, um, the husband that I was searching for was Jesus. Right. Um, and I say this from the pulpit all the time when I, when I speak and when I preach, um, that a man has to learn how to be a wife before he can be a husband when I talk about marriage. And that's hard to wrap your mind around. And so if believers are meant to be the bride of Christ, the church is meant to be the bride of Christ, then a man has to be a bride, has to be successfully be a bride before he can be a husband. As based on scripture, in order to be a, to b- be a successful husband, yeah. you've got to be a servant of of God, yeah, right? The church is the bride of Christ. That's right. That's exactly yeah. right. And so, um, I found my man, and yeah. his name was Jesus. And right. um, and again, it's it's not that I was looking for the wrong thing; I was just looking for the right thing in all the wrong places. And so, I always tell people, I'm not afraid yeah. to say it. I am totally and completely romantically involved with Jesus Christ. And I don't yeah. care who knows it. Yeah, I don't. I just don't care who knows it. Well, let me it. ask you: um, Was this? All right, you, your mom was. I'm assuming. Has she always, as far as long as you've known her, has she been a Christian and been involved in the church? She has. Yeah. Okay. At some point in your younger life, did you? Uh, did, was this a case of where 
you weren't saved when you came to this realization or had you been saved and you were rededicating your life? I feel like that. I feel like that I was, um, uh, saved when I was a, was a youth in youth camp because right. there was some change that took place. Right. There was some, there's some changes in my thought pattern patterns. There was a, um, there was a spirit manifesting in my heart. Um, but I think that, um, I, I didn't get the, uh, discipleship that I needed after that happened, um, or the direction that I needed. And I didn't feel comfortable being transparent and sharing what had happened happened in my life with other people. Right. And so I, I decided to remain in secret. And ag- again, um, uh, secrecy and, um, and uh, the ability to not be transparent is like the devil's playground. So uh, in came, you know, and the whole time, you know, the enemy's like, yo, you didn't. And he's so crafty that he twists things around and makes it almost as though it was your thought in the first place. Yeah. That he wasn't the one that placed it there. Right. And so I begin to think that, uh, you know, that, that, well, that must not have really been a salvation point. So I must not really be saved. So I can, right. I can right. go and do, do as I please, you know. Oh, um, how long after your salvation experience? Did you come to meet Kelly or, or did you, Oh, my transformation uh, experience. Uh, yeah. Did yeah. you, did you, uh, uh, is it okay? I use her name, right? Yeah, that's uh, fine. Okay. Uh, did you, um, have, did you try to date or did you go? I through? did actually. Yeah. Um, after that first year of, uh, sobriety as, as the 12 step program, um, uh, suggests that you do, I did attempt to date two two other, uh, Christian women, um, which were complete disastrous, uh, attempts. Um, and so then I had another encounter. <laughs> Everything everything ends with an encounter. So I prayed one night. Uh, I prayed a Paul prayer. So I prayed in 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 October of 2011. I prayed a prayer to the Lord, and I said, "Lord, just make me like Paul. Make me hopelessly devoted to you." I'm not trying to get like uh, um, Olivia Newton John on you today right. or anything, but <laughs> I said, "Lord, just just I, I just want to be in relationship with you. I, I don't need to be romantically or sexually involved with anybody. I don't need to get married. I just want to be completely devoted to you." Uh, well, that was what he was waiting for me to do because I had taken those Christian relationships with women and replaced him again with that with that. And so it was three three months to the date after I prayed that prayer that Kelly came into the picture. Well, after we dated for a while, found out around the same time that I was praying my prayer, she had made a list of characteristics and uh, things uh, and qualities that she was looking for in a husband and prayed over it around the same time. And then she met me and she had made uh, it was a list of 10 items and then a, a, a list of five items that were bonus bonus items. She still has never told me what was on that list, probably because she knows that I deal with <laughs> arrogance and pride a little bit. But um, <laughs> that's me being transparent. <laughs> but uh, um, it, but she said that I, f- I fulfilled all 15 of those those prayer requests uh, uh, all at one time for her. But um, but yeah, so then we started dating in, in 2012. Um, I proposed in December of 2012, and then we were married in 13, in yeah. 2013. We'd be married uh, seven years this September. Um how old your little boy? Uh, Rylan is um, four and a half. He'll be five in October. So y'all didn't have a child for three or four years, maybe? I about guess. two years. She uh, two About years. two years in, she got pregnant, yeah. Okay. And we really weren't supposed to be able to have children. Um, yeah. okay, that's another miracle. Kelly uh, had... Uh, d- struggled with some endometriosis type issues when she was a, a youth and was on a crazy, crazy uh, form of birth control. Um, and so she actually came off the birth control while we were still dating. Um, because we were talking about it and, um, I can confidently say, and I don't care if anybody, uh, uh, calls me a lame but I can confidently tell you that, um, I made it through my entire courtship and my entire dating experience with my life without even laying down to her, uh, without, without even laying next to her, uh, until our wedding night. Yeah. That was our thing that we, we had our boundaries. So, um, so fortified that we would not even lay down horizontal next to each other the whole entire time yeah. that we were dating. Which is really hard for her because yeah. she'd come home and she'd hear about her other friends c- cuddling for hours on the couch and all this sort of thing. And I was like, honey, I can't cuddle with you. <laughs> Why can't you cuddle with me? Uh, if I need to ex- to explain to you the physical reason why right, I cannot right. cuddle with you, then right. um, we've got issues. <clears throat> because things right. come uh, to attention that don't need to be right. in attention <laughs> right. if you're trying to stay the course and make it to the <laughs> altar without uh, uh, yeah. with, without uh, d- uh, you know giving into premarital sex but well um, speaking on that right there I mean in my own situation I'm, I'm coming up on 52 years mm. and uh, 
you know, me and my wife, you know, we were virgins and when we got married and uh there's of course in your situation maybe a little different. Well, it's not different cuz it would be new to you, but um you know, in my in my situation, I was 18, she was 17 and uh I, you know, I wouldn't trade anything for that mm. the innocence of our situation when yeah. we got married, you know. Um, and I would recommend that for everybody. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Uh, Me too. Yeah. Um, but uh, okay. As far as Kelly goes, um, how much do you know about your past when y'all got to, uh, started dating? Well, we uh, we we kind of had a uh, we kind of had a rule. I always told her, I said, "Don't ever ask a question to which you don't want a complete and honest answer." <laughs> um, and we've kind of let that leak over. In, well, we can't not kind of we have we've let that leak over into our marriage. Um, so there's still there's still dark details in my past that she still doesn't know. Uh, is she um, gonna be surprised by this if she listens? To I don't us? think that we've talked about anything <laughs> today that she would be surprised about. But <laughs> okay. you know, I just I mean I just I was just very uh, frank with her when we started dating. I was like, you know, don't don't ask any, uh, you know, intimate questions that you don't want a complete answer when she, to. When she found out about your past, how did she? Oh, she knew before we started dating. Oh, she did. Oh okay. yeah, she knew. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I came she because she actually came to the launch of my ministry when when, when I when my ministry launched in right. at River of Life in Smyrna. She was there the first night that I shared my testimony oh, that okay. that um uh in and sang and yeah the, the first night that my ministry kind of jumped off yeah and um so yeah she had a lot to, uh, she had a lot to deal with a lot to consider you know <laughs> oh um oh you know yeah you're you know. Your story is, again, I you know, I love stories of redemption. And, uh, you know, um, I I think you bear testimony to the fact that it ain't over till it's over. That's you right. Know? And, and it's still not over. Yeah. I'm still a work yeah. in progress. <laughs> and that's what I tell everybody. There's actually yeah. a statement that, uh, that pops up in our, our promotional video on our ministry page. At, um, and it's like it's actually strategically right as I'm pulling up a piece of broken fence. Mm. And I always say that, uh, you know, Kelly and I, oh, that uh, our family is no different than anybody else's. Yeah, we have a lot of victories in the Lord, but we also have a lot of defeats as well. Right. Um, we have a lot of things that we've overcome. We still have things that we're still dealing with. We still have things that he's still refining within us. And, um, and so, and I always tell people we're just as broken as the next person. The difference is, is our response to our brokenness is we seek his guidance uh, for our brokenness instead of just sitting and festering in it. I always like to say, um, like, like David, why do you think David was a man after God's own heart? I mean, if you look and if you go read the Psalms, David was screwed up, man. Mm -hmm. He was screwed up. I mean, he committed murder. He fornicated. He ran off from his responsibilities. He did all of this crazy stuff. Yeah, he slew the giant. Yeah, he was king. He did all these yeah. other things. And it was like, in, in Psalms, it's like, woe is me, O great and hallowed is thy name, thou father. Where art thou God and you know I mean it's just it's it's this it's this manic depressive uh, mode but my God um, my God where my God why hast thou, thou forsaken me yeah and it's uh and, but if you look a little bit deeper and you look into his response to error in his life his response to the areas of his life that didn't line up with God's righteousness he always came back to the righteousness of God so it was always the choice that he made to come back to the righteousness of God which earned him the label of a, a man after God's own heart. That's just my personal. That's yeah. my personal theologic uh, explanation of that. But yeah. oh, um, now I know you. Um, now, do you do you counsel uh, uh, people on? Uh, you know, they're having these issues like I do. addiction, homosexuality, and all yeah, that. Yeah, our ministry, our nonprofit actually uh, disciples and mentors and counsels um, and, and talks with anybody that's dealing with uh, uh, unwanted same sex desires, anybody who's dealing with alcohol, anybody who's dealing with drug addiction, anybody who's dealing with food issues. Um, there's, there's people out there who um, overeat because they're covering up emotions that they can't deal with. There's people out there who undereat because they're covering up with emotions that they can't deal with. And um, that's part of Kelly's testimony. Um, um, uh, she's, uh, part of her testimony is food issues. And, um, and so she's been trained, um, to, uh, counsel, uh, people that deal with those sorts of issues. And, and she does that in conjunction with our ministry as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if they, uh, wanted to get in touch with you for an issue, uh, how would they contact you? I mean, you can actually just go on the internet and Google Jeremy Myers ministries. 
um, and it, it'll pop up. Um, you can find us on Facebook. Yeah. Um, you can reach us through uh, Transformation Life. You can yeah. email us. I mean, our, our contact information is literally plastered all over the Internet. It's on, yeah. it's on Facebook. It's on Instagram. It's on uh, the ministry webpage. It's on the church webpage. Which the church pe- webpage is yeah. really easy to remember. It's tl.church. That's a super, super easy one to remember. So you can always get in contact with me through that form as well. Oh, is there anything else you want to bring up, or do you think you've covered all the bases? Or uh... I think so. Uh, you know, I just, I just know that there's a lot of people out there who deal with, with identity issues. And uh, it's it's not re- we don't really fully understand ourselves until we know who we are in Christ. We 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 can never really fully understand the the reason why people struggle with gender identity issues is because they don't know who they are in Christ. The reason that people overeat is because they don't know who they are in Christ. The reason that people use drugs is because they don't know who they are in Christ. The reason that people go get drunk is because they don't know who they are in Christ. The reason that I chose a homosexual lifestyle over um, what God had planned for my life for that season is because I didn't fully know who I was in Christ. The reason I get mad at my wife sometimes is because I'm not operating in my identity that is based in Christ. It all comes back to Jesus. It's not Jesus plus something. It's just Jesus. Right. And, and that's what we try to preach at the church at TLC. It's not, it's not Jesus plus a certain kind of environment. It's not Jesus plus a certain kind of music. It's not Jesus plus a certain kind of clothing. It's just Jesus. Come as you are, broken. And as broken as you come is as broken as you need to remain. Right. Because as soon as we start to pick up anything of ourselves is when we start to tell the Lord again that um, we know better than him. But uh, I mean, if I had any advice to anybody out there, I would say if your life is out of control and it doesn't make sense, just turn to Jesus. And I know that sounds cliche. And I know churches have said that for years and years and years. And it's kind of become faux pas and it's kind of become laughed at. But it's true. It's just true true there's nothing on this earth there's nothing in this life that can identify you better than the presence of the lord and the one who created you and you know you're gonna you know by saying that message you're which is true you're gonna catch hell you know exactly uh, it's just like the guy that my pillow you know he uh, you know he he stated what he you know god got christ got him out of his situation i don't know if you're familiar with the guy that um uh does the my pillow commercials uh-huh. yeah. yeah he was a, a bad addict you know and and uh, recently he called hell over you know uh ta- giving his testimony when he was talking about you know giving making masks for this you know virus and everything and i mean the media wore him out it's know? crazy in current in current times our 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 um society and our current culture has an issue with transparency right we have an yeah. issue with transparency right. like the media does not want you to be transparent about stuff because they want to control the thought patterns that people Absolutely. have they want to control um, the and that's a whole different subject but yeah uh, yeah but um we we have an issue with transparency in and out of the church there are people right. that go to church every day and they're dealing with things that they feel like they can't tell somebody about listen if you're out there right now and you're listening to this podcast and you're one of those people and you're going to a church that you feel like you can't tell your pastor or anybody in that church what you're dealing with come talk to me yeah (laughs) i'm not even saying you have to come attend my church just call us reach out to us we'll sit down we'll have coffee we'll grab lunch and you can pour your heart out you can tell me whatever it is you need to get off your chest and i promise you're not going to not going to be greeted with any condemnation and and not going to be greeted with any judgment because i promise you i more than likely have a story that'll trump whatever it is you're dealing with (laughs) oh um well anybody got any uh, last questions they want to ask you no i'm good Uh, okay well jeremy i appreciate you doing this i i hope you know people out there that are struggling with these issues can listen to this and i think we've been pretty candid uh and uh you know, maybe they're saying, whoa, you know, that I, that's what I'm dealing with, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, maybe, you know, help guide them in the right direction. you got to keep it raw. That's what I always say, yeah. Gray. you got to keep it raw. I think people uh, really respect that. They can relate to that. Um, I think there's been too much um, in this country where pastors have been put on pedestals right. and they've been put behind screens where they um, almost present themselves as untouchable. I'm touchable. Right. right. Just like right. Jesus was touchable. I'm right. not, and I'm not trying to say 
that right. I'm anywhere close to being as sanctified as the Lord wants me to be on right. the day on the day of judgment. But right. um, but I, but I am saying that I, that I'm approachable and I want to stay approachable. And at the minute that I portray myself as unapproachable, it's time for me to move on and do something right. different. Right. Yeah. Um. Okay. Well, I like say I want to thank you again. Uh, you know, and um, I I know you know I enjoy doing this with you, and I appreciate you coming out and and uh, being with us. So well, it was an honor. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening.